Hey guys, Derek from Bomb Socks here with more Bomb Bites, feasting upon the words of Christ, and we're doing it one bite at a time. So a couple weeks ago, in preparation for General Conference, I asked you guys how well you knew the lives of our 12 current uh, apostles, and we spent that whole time getting to know each one of them, had a great time with it. I am just curious, how well do you know the Nephite 12 apostles? If you are anything like me, and keep in mind, I have been a seminary teacher for almost 25 years, I think... I could maybe name two or three of them at the most. We just don't know these guys' names very well. So let me take you to 3 Nephi chapter 19, verse 4, where Jesus does organize a quorum of the 12 apostles. So look at 3 Nephi 19, verse 4, where it says, It came to pass on the morrow, when the multitude was gathered together, behold, Nephi and his brother, whom he had raised from the dead, whose name was Timothy, and also his son, whose name was Jonas, and also Methoni, Methoni Ha, his brother, and Cuman and Cumanonhai, uh, and Jeremiah, and Shemnon, and Jonas, and Zedekiah, and Isaiah. Now, these were the names of the disciples whom Jesus had chosen. Came to pass, they went forth and stood in the midst of the multitude. There you go if you're looking for baby names. Great names. I don't know when the last time was you thought about naming a baby Cumanaiha. Great name, just if you're thinking about it. So the reason I bring them up is because they actually have a very prominent role when you fast forward to 3 Nephi 28. Because in 3 Nephi 28, verse 1, Jesus asks all of these Nephite disciples a very important question. I mean, check out this question. And it came to pass when Jesus had said these words, he spake unto his disciples one by one, because that's how Jesus works, saying unto them, what is it that ye desire of me after I have gone to the Father? And the next couple of verses are kind of interesting. They all spake, this is verse two, save it were three. So nine of them said, we desire after we have lived unto the age of man that our ministry wherein thou hast called us may have an end that we may speedily come unto the end of thy kingdom. Verse number three, and he said unto them, blessed are ye because you've desired this thing of me. Therefore, after that ye are 70 and two years old, which apparently is the age of a man. So you dudes out there who are watching this, you will not hit manhood till you're 72, all right? <laughs> ye shall come unto me in my kingdom and with me ye shall find rest. What a great, I mean, you look at that, you're living 72 years and all of a sudden the Lord says, boom, you're good, let's take you up. So that's a great little request. And Jesus says, blessed are you for inquiring of this. And then he turns and he looks, doing some simple math. There's three left. Look at verse number four. When he had spoken to them, he turned himself unto the three and said unto them, what will ye that I should do unto you when I am gone unto the Father? So there's three more. And I can just picture these guys. They're just looking at each other. They're just like, um, oh, you tell, no. Maybe you should tell him. I, I don't know. And I can just see them very nervous with what they want to tell him. In fact, it says they durst not speak unto him the thing which they had desired. And Jesus in verse number six, he said unto them, behold, I know your thoughts. Ye have desired the thing which John, my beloved, who was with me in my ministry, before that I was lifted up by the Jews, desired of me. And then he says in verse number seven, More blessed are ye, for ye shall never taste of death, but ye shall live to behold all the doings of the Father unto the children of men, even until all things shall be fulfilled according to the will of the Father, when I shall come in my glory with the powers of heaven, Brothers and sisters, welcome to the three Nephites. I saw this little the comic. I thought it was funny. It says, thanks to our three strapping strangers who agreed to fill in when our scheduled speakers all canceled at the last minute. Now, when it comes to three Nephite stories, oh, there are urban legends galore. Some of them may even very well be true. But when it comes to three Nephites, here's something to understand. There are more questions than there are answers when it comes to these three wonderful Nephite disciples. So rather than focusing on the things that we don't know and speculate about all kinds of people, who they may or may not be and what they may or may not do, because you think of all of the questions. Well, if they're living forever, what do they eat? Do they have families? Do they have, do they do they blend in? Do they travel together? Are they are they these rogue apostles? Does the prophet know who they are? I mean, there's so many different questions that I do not have answers to. So I want to focus on what we do know versus what we don't know. So here are what I like to call eight truths about the three Nephites. So first of all they will never taste of death or endure the pains of death. And I've thrown the scriptures up here as well if you want to delve into it a little bit further. Sweet little goal there, never taste of death or endure the pains of death. 
Uh, the second one, when the Savior comes in his glory, they will be changed in the twinkling of an eye from mortality to immortality. So they will be twinkled, they'll be changed. Uh, except for the sorrow they feel for the sins of the world, they do not experience pain or sorrow. That emotion will be a foreign concept to them, which is just weird to think about that. They won't experience pain or sorrow. The fourth one here, they help people become converted to the Lord. You are a missionary for the rest of your days and the rest of everyone else's days. Um, they just, their goal is to help people become converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great goal to have. Number five, they cannot be killed or harmed in any way. In fact, you got to go look at these verses here. Look at 19 through 22. And they were cast into prison by them who did not belong to the church. And the prisons could not hold them, for they were rent in twain. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. They put them in prison, prisons fall apart. And they were cast down into the earth, but they did smite the earth with the word of God. That's a cool statement. Insomuch that by his power they were delivered out of the depths of the earth. Therefore, they could not dig pits sufficient to hold them. The earth is so deep, they dig, let's deep, dig it deeper. Nope, doesn't work. Uh, 21, thrice they were cast into a furnace and received no harm. 22, twice they were cast into a den of wild beasts. And behold, they did play with the beasts as a child with a suckling lamb and received no harm. I can just picture them. They're in this lion's den. And all of a sudden they look at them and they're sitting there scratching the lion's belly. You know, Good kitty. You know, I that just to me, that just seems, you know, every Old Testament story like Daniel in the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These guys get to be them. And they aren't harmed in any way. So that's kind of a cool thing. Uh, the next one, Satan cannot, you thought the last one was cool. Satan cannot tempt them or have any power over them. Keeping in mind that we are the ones who give Satan all of his power anyway. So I think that's an interesting promise that they give to them. They cannot tempt them or, or have power over them. They remain in a translated state until the judgment day. Again, they don't, that, they don't taste of death. But they will be resurrected and be received into the kingdom of God. The last one here, they ministered to Mormon and his son Moroni some 400 years later. And uh, he even says, you know, I, I'm about to say who they were, but the Lord said, don't do it. But we want them kind of hidden from the world. Uh, we know we know who the 12 are, so if you want to take some guesses down to who the three are, we just simply do not know. But we do know that they have ministered to Mormon and Moroni uh, during those times where people need that ministering to. And so that's, that's what we know about them. There is one story from church history that I think is kind of interesting. This is from Lucy Max Smith from the history of Joseph Smith by his mother. Um, it says, a late May planting was essential for successful fall crops. Therefore, David Whitmer had to plow and prepare the soil before he could take his two-horse wagon to pick up Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. This was to get the translation started. At the end of a day of plowing, he found he had accomplished in one day what normally would have taken two days to do. David's father was likewise impressed by this apparent miracle. Peter Whitmer Sr. said, there must be an overruling hand in this. I think you would better go down to Pennsylvania as soon as your plaster of Paris is sown. The plaster of Paris was used to reduce the acidity of the soil. The next day, David went to the fields to sow the plaster, but to his surprise, he found the work had been done. His sister, who lived near the field, said that her children had called her to watch three strangers the day before spread the plaster with remarkable skill. She assumed that they were men that David had hired, but David had not hired them. So could this have been the three Nephites? I like to think that idea. I, I don't know if three guys just showed up one day and started to help out. I don't know for sure. But we do know that the three Nephites were there to help that work move forward. So this is all fascinating, but there's two words I want to ask you. This is great. So what? Okay, this is fascinating. So what does this story tell you about Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ? And what can you and I learn from this story of the three Nephite disciples? Well, I saw this quote from Elder Neil A. Maxwell, and he said, what we insistently desire, keeping in mind, this is what these men have desired, over time is what we will eventually become and what we will receive in eternity. Righteous desires need to be relentless, therefore. So I, I just thought that was kind of an interesting way to kind of put a little bit of a relevance rather than just saying, hey, here's a cool story about these three guys who are going out blessing people's lives. I think there's a relevance there for us where it says, look, if we have desires, we need to present them to the Lord and really do that. Now, keeping in mind, the Lord has his own timetable with all of this, and he also has his desires for us as well. 
they're always greater than I think what we have for ourselves. So we need to trust in him, just like these Nephite disciples did as well. Anyway, hope that message helps you out. Hope you found that interesting. Uh, we got more coming up tomorrow. So thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing and thanks for sharing. And we'll see you then. Bye-bye.